Adolf Hitler stands in the shadows, his back to the wall, keeping a low profile. He listens silently as the speaker, Gottfried Feder, discusses the DAP party's 25-point program. But he will not stay silent for long. It is September 12, 1919, and inside the small, musty interior of the Sternecker Brau Beer Hall in Munich, Hitler is attending his first ever DAP meeting. But he is not there as an admirer. He is in attendance as an informant for the German military. In spite of this, the meeting will prove to be one of the most serendipitous and calamitous meetings in human history. Previously on Darkness Over Deutschland, in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution in Munich, a clandestine group of Aryan occultists known as the Thula Society emerged with a fervent determination to overthrow the new Soviet government. Led by Rudolf von Sabotendorf and inspired by esoteric beliefs, anti-Semitism, and Aryan supremacy, the Thula Society embarked on a mission to destabilize the socialist regime. Their schemes included plotting the kidnapping of Bavarian Prime Minister Kurt Eisner. But despite their attempts, Eisner's rule continued until his assassination by a disillusioned aristocrat, Count Anton Arco Valley. To further their counter-revolutionary objectives, the Thula Society endeavored to infiltrate Munich's civilian militia, the Volkswehr. However, their plans were foiled, leading to the arrest of several members and exposing the Society's covert activities. Amid these political machinations, the German Workers' Party, the DAP, is founded. It quickly distances itself from the Thula Society, but still shares its anti-Semitic and anti-communist ideologies. The DAP attracts working-class members, but remains one of the many small extremist parties in Munich and across the Reich. What they need is a central figurehead, a charismatic leader, someone who can elevate them above the horde of nationalist and socialist groups in Germany. They do not have to wait long. It is late November of 1918. The Great War has finally come to an end. Germany finds itself in the midst of a crisis, politically charged, heavily militarized, and with nationalism at a fever pitch. The new government led by a coalition of center-left parties, including social democrats and Catholic centrists, faces challenges that seem insurmountable. Not only do they have to contend with a devastating influenza epidemic and widespread hunger, but extremist groups on both the far left and far right clamoring for their downfall. After months and even years on the battlefields of France, millions of soldiers return home into this catastrophic environment. They find their homes, families, and livelihoods in ruins. In this desperate situation, the provisional Weimar government is forced to take drastic measures to protect the newly formed republic. One of these measures is to order heavy surveillance of the many nationalist and socialist groups throughout the country. In Munich, the German army appoints Adolf Hitler as a government liaison for his company. Hitler is tasked with conveying educational material to the troops and working as an anti-Bolshevist informant. He is to infiltrate the radical political parties in the Bavarian region. Despite having very little political experience, the young Hitler would later claim in his memoir, Mein Kampf, that the war had brought him to a political awakening. He considered himself a courageous soldier who, along with his comrades, had fought and bled for years, only to be betrayed at home by what he calls the November criminals. These November criminals are both socialists and Jews who have brought about Germany's surrender with cowardice and treason. Despite these later claims in his memoir, Hitler started the post-war era as a supporter, not an enemy of the revolution and the social democrats 
at least on the surface. In the spring of 1919, he is elected by his fellow comrades to a soldier's council, one of the institutions of the revolution. From electoral data preserved from the time, over three-quarters of the men in Hitler's unit voted for the mainstream Social Democrats in the January 1919 election. During the Soviet Republic currently reigning in Munich, Hitler's comrades vote him in as deputy battalion representative. His job is to serve as a liaison to the Soviet's Department of Propaganda. Though it may have appeared that he was a fellow communist sympathizer or even revolutionary on the outside, it is likely that Hitler's alleged communist views were nothing but simple opportunism. Young Private Hitler had little desire to return to his pre-war life of poverty and isolation. The army had become more than simply his employer. It has become his home, something he had not had in a long time. It is likely that he adapted to his surroundings in order to survive. In any case, Hitler's communist leanings, real or faked, are soon to be replaced with a more nationalist take on revolution. In September, he will attend a meeting of the DAP, an organization brought about by the failings of Rudolf von Sabotendorf, leader of the Thule Society, in his attempts to bring about the downfall of the Bavarian Soviet Republic. On the night of September 12, 1919, in a small Munich beer hall named the Sternecherbrau, a seemingly insignificant meeting is about to take place. It is a small meeting attended by around 50 participants, but it is a meeting that will change the course of history forever. Adolf Hitler, a former soldier in the German army, now working as an informer, has been assigned to attend a meeting of the small but radical DAP in order to investigate the party and its activities for the military. The DAP, the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, aka the German Workers' Party, has been established on January 5, 1919 by Thule Society members. Anton Drexler, a railroad locksmith, Gottfried Feder, an economist, and Dietrich Eckhart, a right-wing poet. The small nationalist party is one of many that have sprung up in Munich and across all of Germany in such turbulent times. Hitler, accompanied by his army colleague Emil Maurice, enters the dimly lit Munich Beer Hall, its air heavy with tension and anticipation. Hitler finds a spot at the back of the room where he stands in the shadows, quietly observing the scene before him. Dietrich Eckhart was slated to give a speech at the meeting, but has fallen ill. He is replaced at the last minute by another member of the Thule Society and co-founder of the DAP, Gottfried Feder. Feder is known for his vivid anti-Semitic rants against mammonism and interest slavery, which have earned him significant popularity in folkish circles. This popularity does not transfer over to the young Adolf Hitler, however. As Fader stands at a podium at the front of the room, passionately addressing the small audience, he fails to win over the future Führer. Fader talks of a radical vision for Germany and outlines his vision in a 25-point program. He outlines the party's nationalist and anti-Semitic platform, advocating for the exclusion of Jews from German society and the establishment of a greater Germany. Unimpressed by the speech, Hitler starts to leave the gathering, but just as he's about to go, another DAP member voices a plea for Bavaria to break away from the rest of the Reich. This deeply agitates Hitler, a young Austrian who has harbored dreams of a greater German Reich throughout his life. Filled with rage, he delivers an impromptu speech advocating for pan-Germanic racial unity. His powerful speech resonates with the audience. Hitler reportedly refutes the man with such force and passion that he admits defeat mid-conversation and quickly exits the beer hall. Anton Drexler, impressed by Hitler's spontaneous and compelling intervention, presses a pamphlet into Hitler's hands entitled My Political Awakening and urges him to join the DAP.
While Hitler had been unimpressed with the meeting, in this DAP pamphlet, he finds in Drexler a prophet after his own heart. From here on out, Hitler and the DAP will become forever intertwined and will reshape Germany in ways that even they dared not imagine at this time. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving it a thumbs up or leaving a short comment. This will ensure the podcast can be seen and heard by more people, which will allow Enigma Productions to keep this series going. Thank you for listening to the Darkness Over Deutschland podcast.